Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. A book called Alien in the Mirror brings refreshing clarity and sanity to a topic long shrouded in smoke and mirror confusion. In a moment, Randall Fitzgerald back with us on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Nori with you. Randall Fitzgerald began his journalism career in 1974 in Washington, D.C. as an investigative reporter for syndicated columnist Jack Anderson. He has since written for the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and for 20 years plus was an editor with Reader's Digest. Randall is the author of several books, including Lucky You, Proven Strategies You Can Use to Find Your Fortune, and The Hundred Year Lie, How Food and Medicine Are Destroying Your Health. That came out in 2007. And Alien in the Mirror, Extraterrestrial Contact Theories and Evidence. Randall, welcome back. How are you? Hi. I'm glad to be with you, George. Very well. Thank you. You tied the UFO phenomenon into the human consciousness. Tell us about that. Yes, well, let me start with what does this book title, Alien in the Mirror, mean? Mm -hmm. It has uh, multiple meanings. Uh, For one, when we look into, if we think of this phenomenon, whatever it is, as a a metaphor, if we look at it from the standpoint of uh, human reactions to it, Uh, There's definitely a a psychological phenomenon uh, that can be studied about how people react to the unexplained and what they see uh, in the sky or what uh, appears uh, that's unexplainable. Uh, So certainly uh, we're looking at the the mysteries of our own existence to some extent, who we are, why we are, those sorts of uh, questions. And on another level, uh, another meaning for the title, Alien in the Mirror, uh, if the theory holds true that the human species was seeded on this planet and that our origins are elsewhere, then indeed we are the aliens that we are seeking uh, when we look in uh, the mirror of our collective uh, consciousness and our consensus reality. And then a third meaning is... uh, The title refers to mirror neurons in our brain. Uh, It was only in the last two decades that mirror neurons were discovered uh, in the human brain, as well as in the brains of some other uh, intelligent species. And these are specialized cells that are responsible for us being able to feel empathy, empathy for other human beings, empathy for other species, And it's through these particular mirror neurons that we seem to be able, according to neuroscientists, to mimic the behavior of other humans. Uh, Animals mimic behavior between them uh, and and mimic human behavior that they observe. Babies using mirror neurons uh, mimic behavior. And a, a theory that over time I've begun to develop is that in a certain sense, Maybe these mirror neurons that we all possess and that we possess as a species uh, are what is enabling us to interact with this phenomenon. And I call it uh, the UFO uh, phenomenon, but it's also the, the paranormal in general, that entire phenomenon. And by way of interaction, uh, what I'm saying is that when we as a species uh, observe something that we can't uh, explain, we, of course, try to explain it in the context culturally uh, of our belief systems, our conditioning, uh, et cetera. Uh, But maybe something else is going on. Maybe there is an intelligence, uh, a consciousness behind this phenomenon which needs us, needs to interact with us. And through this interaction, uh, this phenomenon is empowered. Uh, and in turn, um, even though it can be frustrating for us uh, and, and our curiosity gets aroused and we can't explain what we're seeing, but maybe it's empowering us as well as a species 
to continue to ask the important and relevant questions about uh, who are we and why are we. Back in the 60s, the late British oceanographer Ivan Sanderson theorized that UFOs were a form of life native to this planet, and he talked about submersible UFOs and everything else. He was into it in a big way, wasn't he? He was. uh, He's one of those overlooked uh, authors. Uh, He was a a biologist, uh, well-known and uh, widely published in the academic world, biologist. And uh, I try to find a lot of these overlooked authors uh, to feature uh, in my book. And Sanderson was an interesting character. He wrote a book in 1967 called Uninvited Visitors, in which he made a case that many UFOs are a form of life, uh, a living machine creature that may or may not be native to this planet, but that lives uh, in the atmosphere at times and lives in the oceans at times and uh, has this uh, ability to sort of morph uh, its shape. And a couple of years later, Sanderson wrote another book, which uh, I remember reading when it came out, called Invisible Residence, in which he elaborated on this theory, and he made a case that UFOs uh, have underwater bases in the oceans. And he was one of the first, if not the first, uh, author in in this UFO realm to start making uh, a case along that line. And in going back and rereading his books, which I urge everyone to do if you have access to these books, they're pretty rare books these they, days. They really are, yeah. But uh, Sanderson had found a quote from Nikolai Tesla, uh, the inventor of the alternating uh, alternate current. current. It, some, he said this about alien visitation early in the 20th century, and it was something that was quite overlooked by scholars uh, in connection with Tesla. Uh, Tesla said, and I'm quoting here from Sanderson's book, some intelligent beings from other worlds might be present here in our world in the very midst of us, for their constitution and life manifestations may be such that we are unable to perceive them. Uh, And Sanderson had been inspired by that uh, quote from Tesla, uh, and as a biologist, uh, he had taken uh, that particular idea and sort of run with it uh, in a way that was uh, actually uh, very provocative. The psychiatrist uh, Carl Jung also had ideas about UFOs way back in the 50s. He He was way ahead of his time. Indeed, he wrote a book in 1959, another book that's quite often overlooked, called um, Flying Saucers. And in that book, he took his theories about the human collective unconscious, and he applied it to the UFO phenomenon. And he asked a series of questions uh, that if indeed the collective unconscious of humanity is something that uh, projects uh, that, that it's almost like a, a, a thought form, um, below conscious awareness, uh, and that it connects all of us to each other. Maybe it connects us to whatever we're seeing. Uh, at that time, it was considered flying saucers, um, the strange lights in the sky. And he had this idea about archetypes, uh, which are patterns of images and ideas that we as a species hold in common. Uh, no matter what culture we were raised in. And he applied this archetype idea to uh, UFOs, or as he called them, uh, flying saucers. Uh, I mean, we know, for instance, uh, that in his book, uh, he thought perhaps, and he was speculating here, but he thought that UFOs might be a species of a living creature, much like Sanderson did uh, a decade or so later in his books. Uh, But ultimately, uh, Carl Jung uh, concluded that UFOs are either a material nuts and bolts type of phenomenon, or it's a psychic projection from humankind's collective unconscious, uh, and it appears uh, to fulfill some religious need uh, that we have to believe in a higher power that rules the universe. Back in 2002, there was a uh, George Clooney movie that came out, Solaris, that you've looked at, too, where he was a troubled psychologist sent to investigate a crew on a research station. And uh, your themes are... Yes, interesting. 
Yeah, did you see that, uh, George? It was a great movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very thought provoking. It, it base was a, it, on a 1961 science fiction novel by the Polish science fiction writer Stanislaw Lem, and the Russians had gotten a hold of the material and had optioned uh, that particular novel, and um, the Soviet Union came out with a film uh, that was based on it, uh, which was a, a very interesting film as well, and then George Clooney got a hold of the material and, and did the, uh, a sequel, but the, the premise for the movie and the book was that the planet Solaris is a sentient being. Well, in this particular plot, the planet itself uh, is a sentient uh, entity that sort of recreates the memories uh, that the humans that are visitors uh, on a space station circling the planet uh, have. And uh, the planet is able to bring the life, for instance, um, dead people from the memories uh, of George Clooney and the other characters. And it brings to mind the idea of a planetary mind. Uh, it, it's been active in science fiction, but now it's sort of infiltrating science fact. And let me give you a good example of that. In the February 2022 issue of the Science Journal, International Journal of Astrobiology, several astrophysicists from Arizona State University and the University of Rochester uh, wrote a science article that was proposing that maybe – Cognitive activity is operating on a planetary scale, uh, Earth included, that the sum total of all of the intelligence on this planet, all the human intelligence, all of the uh, various levels of animal intelligence, uh, e even intelligence, uh, however one might define that at the level of plants, that the sum total of it together could be a planetary type of sentient uh, being intelligence. And what these astrophysicists were proposing is that somehow science needs to figure out how to do a, a search uh, through the universe of you, using the web telescope and other means uh, to find the signatures for uh, an evolving uh, group or mind planetary uh, intelligence. Now, this was a, a NASA grant that funded this particular study uh, done uh, this year. Uh, and it, there was an interesting conclusion at the end of this study. Um, the scientists concluded, and I'm going to quote here from the, the particular paper, they indicated that, quote, Earth's planetary intelligence operates via a feedback loop that's global in scale, coordination, and operation. And that if we begin to recognize the interactions that are occurring uh, between various levels of intelligence on our own planet, we'll be in a better position to eventually recognize global minds emerging on other planets where extraterrestrial life may have evolved or may be evolving. This is very similar to this idea of uh, Solaris that was popular in this science fiction movie. And, when, and it's just so many people have come up with so many thoughts and ideas about extraterrestrial life. Jacques Vallée wrote your foreword to your book, and he's one of the best. He is indeed, and, and concerning uh, animal intelligence, for instance, Chuck was one of the first uh, of the UFO researchers and writers to propose that if we ever hope to really, truly communicate with an extraterrestrial intelligence uh, as one species to another, we have to begin by learning how to communicate with intelligent life forms that already exist on our planet. Uh, how can we communicate, for instance, uh, with uh, the, all the primate species? How do we communicate uh, with the intelligent uh, parrots uh, and, and crows? You know, look at the octopus, for instance. In all of its arms, it has a mini brain. You know, the octopus uh, has often been hypothesized to be uh, an alien being on this planet because it seems so out of place. 
in the context of other life forms. Uh, so Jacques proposed that we needed to have sort of a Manhattan-type project uh, in, in order to be able to unite biologists and neuroscientists and all the various uh, academic disciplines to begin to truly find answers to how we begin to communicate with the intelligent species already on the planet. You believe that we are never going to get to the bottom line of UFOs and ETs until we bring in a different kind of approach. Is that correct? Yes, and it's that holistic sort of approach that Jacques Vallée is proposing uh, to bring together all these various disciplines, because if we think in terms of the phenomenon, whatever it is, and I always put it in, a, in journalistic terms because I'm still a journalist and I try to evaluate all the different points of view, all the different uh, theories and types of evidence and so forth. Uh, and in doing that, in doing that process, uh, it always has seemed to me that in order to communicate from one species to another, uh, that we can't look at it from a top-down sort of approach. We, we can't assume and hope that an advanced species is going to have already have figured out how to communicate with us. Uh, we need to have, as a species, some sort of uh, process underway to where we're already thinking in terms of not just through radio telescope signals, which we've been doing through SETI for decades, but, but rather, uh, again, using species that are intelligent on our planet as a prototype, using them as models uh, to begin thinking in terms of uh, how we really, one species to another, uh, will communicate uh, important information in the future. Randall, you brought John Keel from Mothman Prophecies into the picture. Tell us about that. Yes, he's another one whose books that I have read and I summarize in Alien in the Mirror um, in, in the chronology of the development of uh, ideas and evidence. So John Keel, like me, w was a journalist. He wrote in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, his most famous book, as you point out, was The Mothman Prophecies, made into that movie with R Richard Gere. Yep. Uh, the second book he wrote was UFOs, Operation Trojan Horse, and the third one was The Eighth Tower. And in those books, he speculated that UFOs are primarily electromagnetic in origin and have an ability to manipulate matter. And as a result, they masquerade as planes or balloons or pretty much anything they want uh, to morph into in order to deceive humans. Uh, John Keel believed that the intelligence that was directing this phenomenon uh, wasn't necessarily uh, extraterrestrial. He, he thought it was in an intelligent energy field, and this field helps explain not only the UFO phenomenon, but religious miracles, visitations attributed to angels, uh, you know, everything that we think of uh, as part of the paranormal uh, throughout human history. So uh, there was another aspect uh, to Keel which I found uh, interesting. He, he thought the UFO phenomenon would never really be solved because it was a kind of cosmic joke perpetuated by entities who have always been around to confuse us and, and to frighten humans. And in a certain sense, uh, it's like they're experimenting with ways to undermine our sanity uh, because we can never quite figure out uh, their intentions or the intentions of this uh, intelligence behind the phenomenon. So ultimately, Keel believed that there was a super spectrum of energies that sort of span the electromagnetic realm and this accounts for the intelligent energy field uh, that's trying to manipulate us. Tell us about the tie-in between the Princeton University Global Consciousness Project and some of the things you've written about. Yes, I, I tried to link all of this evidence together uh, from you know, this February 2022 20, study uh, by the astrobiologist uh, and then uh, the ideas of Ivan Sanderson and Carl Jung and so forth about the, the global mind. And uh, I was looking for examples of true-to-life science experiments uh, that might have uh, shown 
the parameters or at least the shadow impact of a, a global mine phenomenon. And the best example I could find was a series of experiments done at Princeton University at the School of Engineering starting in about 1979. And what they were investigating, they called it the Global Consciousness Project, appropriately. Uh, they were using random uh, event generators. They're very similar to random number generators uh, in computers. And they were testing the ability uh, uh, at first of individuals to mentally be able to influence uh, the random number output, the distribution uh, of these various computers. Uh, and it was sort of a mind over matter uh, experiment. And they graduated from working with individuals to working with uh, groups of people. And so they came up with the idea uh, in the 1980s to uh, have uh, scattered around the globe uh, 36 computers altogether that had these random event generators working that were spewing out uh, these random numbers uh, constantly uh, for months and years on end. And what they wanted to do was to, to measure whether or not the sum total of the attention of human consciousness on world events could affect, at the subatomic level, the uh, distribution of these random numbers in these computers. And so they began to look at various events uh, starting with, and this was the, the biggest event, of course, uh, September 11th, 2001, the terrorist yes. events in so New York. They had a spike then. Washington, D.C. And yes, uh, it, you probably had guests discussing this uh, on your program. Yes. There was a large statistical spike in that second-by-second second, uh, data stream from these computers uh, throughout uh, the planet. Uh, on the morning of September 11th. And it was an effect that seemed far beyond chance, which uh, seemed to be the global mind uh, at work. So they began uh, doing this experiment uh, in a much more vigorous fashion after that, once they got this uh, initial uh, persuasive evidence, and they started finding similar spikes in the data being recorded for it other dramatic news days, uh, you know, for instance, um, before midnight on New Year's uh, 2000, the Y2K transition, uh, there was a huge spike. Uh, there were huge spikes uh, with the death of Princess Diana in uh, Britain, for instance. And these spikes, when they were graphed, were um, certainly beyond chance uh, by uh, any reasonable uh, person uh, examining the data would have to assume that something uh, was at work that we couldn't really explain in conventional terms. But the scientists that were involved at Princeton uh, had, they were quite aware of Carl Jung's hypothesized collective unconscious. And they were wondering whether maybe what they were recording was sort of like a, a seismograph uh, charting earthquake activities, but in this case, it was uh, activity in the collective human consciousness. It was amazing, wasn't it? It was indeed, uh, and it still is. Um, and, of course, the skeptics, and there were many uh, in the science realm, who claimed that the experiments really were the result of, of ignoring the laws of physics, so they had to be anomalies. Uh, and um, they tried, uh, the skeptics did, to replicate... Uh, the results, but but they weren't successful, and there were a lot of reasons why they weren't successful. Um, you know, for one, they didn't have uh, 36 or 37 computers uh, scattered in countries around the globe. Uh, they had much more limited experiments, uh, and secondly, they they went in with the old confirmation bias, where you go in claiming or thinking that something is impossible, and, and thus the results you're going to get are going to be null and void. And of course, what do you? end up with. You end up with results that are null and void and can't replicate the original results. But it still is, George, I think probably the most persuasive uh, science evidence for this idea of a planetary consciousness.
Randall Fitzgerald with us. We're going to take calls with him next hour here on Coast to Coast, just in a few minutes, as a matter of fact. His website, alieninthemirror.com, and his latest book is Alien in the Mirror, Extraterrestrial Contact Theories and Evidence. In your opinion, ETs, other planetary systems, or somewhere else? Uh, I'm going to act on intuition here, you know, not not on logic, uh, because I, I try to apply critical thinking uh, to everything uh, and as a journalist. But uh, intuitively, uh, I feel like it's uh, uh, interdimensional. Much like uh, Jacques Vallée believes. Yes, yes, I, I've come around to his... Uh, way of thinking and his perspective on this, not just as a result of reading all of his books, which are all uh, brilliant. Oh, they sure are. Randall, stay with us. We'll come back and take calls with you next on Coast to Coast AM. Randall, let's talk a little bit more about your thoughts about the interdimensional. You're not alone in that. A lot of people think that. Uh, yes. Uh, it's certainly... Everyone has been watching this series uh, on the History Channel, Skinwalker Ranch. Yes. <laughs> Comes away after each episode uh, wondering uh, if, when they talk about portals, whether they're, they're talking about interdimensional uh, transference of, of, of something. Uh, you know, the phenomenon is quite intriguing there. And uh, it, it strikes me uh, as if um, that particular program uh, is changing a, a lot of people's perspective on the nature of what this phenomenon is. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, there could be all kinds of things going on. But let's talk a little bit more about good old planet Earth. Do you think it's alive like an organism? Uh, well, that's a good <laughs> provocative question. Uh, if it's a planetary mind uh, and that uh, it is sentient, uh, much like uh, in the movie Solaris, uh, then uh, one would think that uh, it is uh, in that respect. Uh, I mean, that's where we get a lot of our ideas uh, about, you know, the environmental movement uh, being based on Gaia, uh, and that Gaia is like a, a living entity, and that when you take all of the life forms on the planet, you know, the sum total synergistically, uh, is creating something uh, much bigger, much more important than the uh, individual parts of that intelligence. In the movie Contact, uh, from the book that Carl Sagan wrote, he believes that there were extraterrestrials out there, just never believed that they came here. What are your thoughts on that? I, I have several of them. Sagan's book summarized uh, in my book, uh, The Demon Haunted World, for instance, was one of his last. And he was very much, uh, as most of your listeners know, um, a skeptic about uh, extraterrestrial visitation. Uh, he tried, he said, to be open-minded on the subject, but he, uh, using Occam's razor, uh, mm -hmm. just never found uh, the evidence sufficient uh, to convince himself. Uh, he had some candidates uh, that he, before he died, uh, mentioned uh, as, as possible uh, interesting um, uh, evidence of uh, visitation. And one was the famous face on Mars, uh, which uh, you've had on your program many, many times shows. over the years, and, you know, which apparently turned out not to be uh, as uh, much of a face as we thought, more of an eroded mesa. But at the time that uh, Sagan was writing, uh, uh, he was intrigued by that. He was also intrigued by the Drogon tribe in Mali and uh, the, the idea that maybe they had some astronomical information that had been passed down from one culture to another that, that they shouldn't uh, technologically uh, have had about the Sirius star system. And, of course, Robert Temple wrote that famous book back in 1976, The Serious Mystery, in which he uh, took that uh, idea and elaborated on it. And, and Sagan thought that might be compelling, uh, but we've never been able to actually prove that uh, either. So, um, you know, Sagan was a bit of an enigma. He was a, the great popularizer of, of science, as we know, and uh, he, he, we owe it uh, to him um, with this millions upon millions uh, expression uh, uh, that inspired a lot of people to get uh, involved in astronomy and uh, to, to think in terms of life 
uh, elsewhere, but uh, he was pretty much, if not an agnostic, then an, an atheist about visitation. Next hour after you, uh, Randall, my guest is going to talk about the uh, fallen angels, the biblical fallen angels, where mm-hmm. he believes that they might be alien. Interesting. Uh, you know, in looking at the chronology of the theories and evidence uh, that evolved in the different uh, categories, like ancient astronauts and UFOs, UFO occupants, uh, contactees and abductees, and so forth, um, I charted um, various periods where some of the more provocative uh, books appeared, and uh, 1975 was a particularly good year for UFO-related books, and there are two in particular that come to mind uh, along this line, uh, having to do with uh, the juxtaposition of of religion and belief in extraterrestrial life. Uh, The two books that appeared in 1975 that I highlighted uh, were sort of Christian mainstream views about the UFO phenomenon. And in the first book, um, by two fundamentalist Christians. It was titled, UFOs, What on Earth is Happening? And they argued that UFO occupants uh, are demons, and that they are here using occult methods like telepathy to communicate uh, with humans. And these demons are here in UFOs to prepare us for the arrival of the Antichrist. Well, Hmm. ironically, just a few months later after that book was released, Another book appeared, this one by the Baptist evangelist Billy Graham, and this book was titled Angels, God's Secret Agents. And in this book, uh, the Reverend Graham claimed that UFOs uh, may be piloted by angels who are visiting Earth to assist uh, human beings in battling satanic forces, and that these uh, angels and the UFOs uh, may be here to prepare us for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So here you have two books, both appearing in 1975, that take uh, opposite uh, perspectives on this whole uh, idea uh, of whether or not uh, extraterrestrials can be viewed through a religious lens. Uh, If we look at other religions, Buddhism, for instance, uh, the idea of a multiplicity of worlds has been common in uh, Buddhist thought for uh, several thousand years, uh, the same with uh, the Hindus. Hindus had never really had a problem with the idea of, of life elsewhere. In fact, uh, the Hindus, in terms of reincarnation, uh, have even proposed uh, that maybe we are reincarnated alien beings, and vice versa, that some alien beings are reincarnated uh, from humans. Uh, so there are a lot of different perspectives uh, of religion uh, on this particular subject. Randall, thank you. Good luck with your book, Alien in the Mirror. Up next, Scott Mitchell joins us. He believes aliens might actually be fallen angels. Think about that. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.